Welcome to GOMA. This is uh, a pretty exciting kind of kickoff for our 10th birthday uh, celebrations. Um, my name is Geraldine Barlow. I'm the Curatorial Manager of International Art here at the Gallery. Um, I'd like to uh, begin today's conversation by acknowledging the um, Jagara and Turrbal people, the traditional owners of the country where we're meeting, and this beautiful uh, bend of the river, Kurilpa, uh, very much a traditional um, meeting place for a long, long period. And we can um, think to the uh, ceremonies and gatherings which would have occurred on this site, and we're really happy to be uh, keeping these uh, traditions alive and renewed today with uh, Nick Cave and Bob Faust and Will Gill. And can I also just uh, kind of ask for a special shout out from our dancers up the back. Um, <laughs> we have had the most amazing morning together, um, <laughs> kicking off this project Heard, uh, which is uh, a feature of our 10th birthday celebrations which will uh, open over the weekend of the 3rd and the 4th of December. Um, so you can see that uh, preparations are very much um, in play. Please come back and join us for, um, for this special period. Uh, the performance will also occur again in uh, mid-January of Heard. So um, there's a lot of uh, training going on at the moment, but I must say it's just kicked off with, uh, with such energy. So um, super exciting. and. Uh, to my left, I've kind of pre-introduced um, Nick Cave, so um, our beautiful artist who we're delighted to welcome here. Um, Nick has a background uh, in visual arts, also in fashion and movement. Uh, many of you may know his uh, sound suits. Uh, Heard is really um, a larger gathering of the sound suits, which together um, for this particular work, each sound suit is actually made up of uh, two people. Uh, so two people working and coordinating their movements to become a horse. And I kind of am finding it very intriguing. I think it's uh, you kind of step out of your usual everyday pattern of behaviour and become another creature. But it seems to take us back to our own... Uh, humanity and energy and sense of potential. The energy in the room this morning was really quite extraordinary. So, um, yeah, very exciting. So next to Nick, um, Bob Faust, uh, Nick's longtime collaborator, also background in uh, graphic design mm -hmm. and uh, working a lot on the production side of things with Nick, partners, uh, so great exchange of energy. Uh, history together as rainbow. <laughs> yeah. um, and, um, and then beside Bob, Will Gill. Uh, so Will has now worked on uh, the eight prior performances of Heard with Nick and Bob. And, um, you know, perhaps we could kick off the conversation even by, um, if you could uh, tell the story a little about how you, you guys met um, Will. <laughs> Nick. Me? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. I'll let be Nick. Your question. Me, Will. He describes it better. Uh, you. No, I think it's you. <laughs> okay. Uh, you hi. telling this story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I made that a little <laughs> unclear, didn't I? <laughs> <coughs> That's really Nick right there, though. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I think it was maybe about eight years ago, and I was working on a project in Philadelphia at the uh, Philadelphia, F the Fabric Workshop Museum. And I was going in that morning to rehearse with a group of performers. And when I got there, they were, I was thinking, I've got to get there. They need, we need to warm up in order for us to sort of proceed forward. And when I got there, they were warming up at that moment. And I was like, wow, who's warming up the dancers? And he was sort of took liberty and 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 was sort of working with everyone, and so it was really sort of a, an amazing sort of moment to sort of recognize uh, someone sort of taking that sort of leadership and and sort of making that happen. And so from that point forward, we've been working together on on special projects. And uh, you know, when I need to have him travel to Dakar, I just call him and say, hey, do you want to go to Dakar? 
Yes. <laughs> so he goes, sure, when are we going? So we just work in that way. But it's really sort of nice to sort of work with Will. And uh, today has been like so magical. This morning I was just going crazy because it was <laughs> the energy was so on point. The dancers were so completely into it. Drummers. Uh, the drummer. drummers were just magnificent. So we're, we're already off to this amazing start, you know, under Will's sort of direction. So thanks, Will. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, <coughs> this project has a given shape to it, doesn't it, that you devised from the outset, but every time it comes to a, a new city and is uh, kind of shared and enabled amongst a group, new group of dancers and musicians, it seems to become something else, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, for, for me, the mo you know, one of the most important things when it comes to this type of work is that I'm interested in bringing a project to a city and then hiring the community to build the project. So it's really sort of me sort of stepping back and sort of seeing who's here, like who lives in your city mm -hmm. that perhaps we can sort of interface with to sort of build um, a sort of a body of people that can sort of help sort of facilitate an idea. So it's really important to us to sort of leave an imprint as opposed to an impression. And that it's, you know, and I sort of came to this idea of when I was younger and I remember sort of seeing Avenelli for the first time and I was like, you know, wanted to be on the stage. And just that sort of separation between, you know, performing and, and you as a viewer. And, and, and so I've always sort of thought about when I was doing these sort of collaborative performances that Yes, I could bring an entire troupe, I could bring musicians, we could come and do the work and then get on the plane Change and then be out of here. <laughs> right. But it's really sort of very special when we can come into cities and then work with the people, the local people. It's, uh, it makes, for us, it makes for a new experience. You know, we change up the musicians. Sometimes it's classical. classical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's percussionist. Uh, we've had indie rock groups. We've yeah. had DJs. We've had harpists and African drummers. So it, it really mixes up quite a lot. And so then we're not bored with our own work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I can get bored. So, uh, yeah. so it's it keeps it fresh. It keeps it uh, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, you know, it sort of recharges and sort of, you know, we're sort of always sort of looking at other ways of thinking and making. Mm. I mean, even the, in the rehearsal today, I sort of came up with a new project just based on what I was seeing. So I'm working all the time on new ideas and new performances. And so yeah. that's what I told Bob today. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, could you um, take us back into uh, the circumstances in which you uh, kind of uh, came up with the first sound suit, um, how that evolved for you? Yeah, you know, uh, prior to the first sound suit, I was really sort of doing large construction sort of paintings that were like 8 by 16 feet. I don't know what that is in <laughs> your measurements. <but> <laughs> meters. <laughs> in meters, <laughs> but... <laughs> so it was like large. paintings that are like Two this feet. sort of size yeah. and on the wall, but then that would move to the floor. And it was not until 1992 when the LA riots, the Rodney King incident happened, that really sort of literally just sort of turned my whole way of thinking about art and the role in which it played within my sort of practice. And so for me, it was m my only sort of savior at that particular moment. It was. It was a place that I could go to and sort of work out all of these sort of frustrations and these sort of angers. And so the first sound suit was in response to that. And it was really, 
And it was the LA riots. So it was really was really the first video that was sort of caught on uh, camera showing uh, these police beating this sort of black individual. And, uh, you know, and so the entire country just was in outrage. And so it was sort of me in sort of a call and response to that. And so, you know, as for me, I sort of was sort of just sort of wondering, like, what does it feel like to feel discarded, uh, less than dismissed, and based on just also what I was reading about this incident. And I happened to be in the park one day sitting, and I looked down on the ground, and there was this twig. Mm -hmm. And I, that became the metaphor for the first sound suit. It was something that was discarded, dismissed. Uh, and I just proceeded to start collecting all of those. And then I took them to my studio, started to build the sculpture, and didn't know that I could physically wear it. Mm -hmm. Then I put it on, and then I started to move, and then it made sound, and then I just got even more excited. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's how sounds it came about, was really through that sort of process. Mm -hmm. And so as it made sound, then I started to think about the role of protest. In order to be heard, you've got to speak louder. So it just sort of to sort of unfold and really sort of really answer all my questions. Um, and it sort of hid gender, race, class. Mm -hmm. So you're forced to look at something without judgment. And so I started to do this body of work for probably four years, sort of really like in the closet sort of, in this strange, I don't know why, but I don't know, it was like, I wasn't quite, it was like, I knew it was something, but I didn't think, and I knew that I wasn't ready to deal with it mm. in, 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 in terms of the attention the that public. could. Yeah. yeah. And so basically I just sort of went underground and started doing other things. And it has been haunting me f forever until I sort of came around and sort of had to face, face it and get on with things. And tell me about <laughs> that, um, what the circumstances were when you then first let that project out after that kind of gestation process. You know, and prior to, you know, I was, I had a retail store, so I was doing clothing. Uh, I was also doing, having other art sort of projects and shows around other art mediums, but it was just one day I woke up and something said, now or never. Yeah, it's time. And I just had to, like, take that leap of faith. And were there a you group know? of suits at that point? Oh, yeah, it was a group. Because now how it's many? About, it was about <laughs> maybe, I think I had a, 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 a there was a solo, a solo show coming up that I had, and it was maybe, what, what do you say, about 30? Cultural at the Cultural Center? Center? 30. It was about 30 um, sculptures uh, that I was presenting, and, um, and then it opened. And then the next day, you know, I got this call from this New York gallery, and, mm. you know, they wanted to represent me. And then, you know, they all sold in, like, 24 hours. <laughs> it's just a lot <laughs> happening, and I was just like, what is going on? Yeah. Yeah. At the same time. It's off and away. It's been let loose. Yeah, and I just had to sort of cry and settle down and work, <laughs> <laughs> and work through it until I had an understanding yeah. of what's happening. So we're probably like, we want, we want more. <laughs> oh, yeah, they were definitely asking for that. Yeah. <laughs> and, <I just> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and then well. how, did, um, how did Herd come about? Because that's, uh, that's quite another step again, isn't it? Um, yeah, and so, you know, I've been doing sort of the sculpture work, the sound suits for, I would say, about 20 years before Heard sort of, sort of happened. And, uh, <coughs> you know, it was a project that was, uh, you know, I think it, you know, Creative Capital is who I, who sort of sponsored the project. Mm. And, uh, it was, they offered this project and wanted to work with uh, 
the sort of transit authority, which is the public transportation in New York City, Grand Central Station, and to house the piece there. And so then I sort of to think about, you know, it's a different way of thinking. I'm not thinking about really what I'm making as opposed to, you know, a project that, that scale, that changes how I sort of operate in the studio. It's not that I'm sort of making these sort of singular sort of pieces. It's really about, it's, you know, uh, a Grand Central Station is a, is, you know, where, you know, it's a central hub where everybody yeah, sort of that flow is of flowing and, and passing from one place to another. And so, you know, what does that mean? What do you sort of, how do you sort of create something that perhaps can sort of stop one in their tracks mm. and sort of, uh, you know, force them to sort of experience something? So, you know, I'm thinking about that in the studio. I'm also thinking about the fact that, you know, basically it's busy in the mornings at you know, between eight and nine people going to work, and then at, in the evenings, people coming home from work. So I started to think about that and just the sort of like the sort of, ex you know, the exhaustion that we all have, you know, a, a day at work, and sometimes it's not always happy, and it can be sort of, sort of uh, heavy and sort of uh, demanding, and so, my idea was, you know, how do we get back to this dream state? How do we dream about what our future mm. can be? And, and how do we sort of, and for me, dreaming is optimism. It's really sort of like keeps me very alive and always sort of open to possibilities. And, and so this project sort of came out of that. It's out of this sort of imaginary sort of space in my head that allows room to sort of dream about um, all sorts of things. And I think it goes back to when I was a kid and my mother put the sock on her hand and this and then was talking to me and this was a puppet. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just about a second how, you know, one can, something can just sort of transform your know, sort of connection and that became magical and like, like larger than life and so that's really where the idea sort of came from, is looking at early puppetry mm. as, a, as, a, as a sort of starting point and then building from that. And do you think that that allows maybe something that was always within us, you know, the kind of other character or even multiple other characters to come forth via the, uh, the sound suits and the interaction with other people that... Um, you know, this a kind of latent uh, other entity or uh, or some part of ourselves can just... Yeah I, think, yeah, I think we forget that, you know, as adults we still, that's still very sort of there. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, you know, how do we sort of find ways to exercise that and, and uh, how do you stay relevant? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something yeah. has to sort of inspire you or sort of feed you in, right. in some sort of capacity. Mm -hmm. I think we all want to believe. We all want to believe in something, something good, something great, something more. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, we're all just taught all these tiny little lessons that build on top of us that tell that us, you know, you down. don't <coughs> get to believe that anymore. It's going to be this way. It's going to be that way. And so by putting this thing in front of a viewer, and kind of disrupting that regular kind of squashing mechanism that mm -hmm. is life, right? It allows us to um, open up and be a little bit more kid-like and start to believe that those really are horses, that mm -hmm. they're, you know. And they are. They're magical. <laughs> <laughs> they like me, yeah. you know. So when I, um, I had the opportunity to be in Sydney um, on Thursday and see the, the Pit Street performance and the kind of... Uh, <coughs> gasps from the audience and the smiles on everyone's faces uh, were quite extraordinary and this sense of almost like a circling rising energy mm -hmm. being generated uh, almost kind of emanating via the performers but I think also this this is very interesting uh, feedback loop which yeah. some of that is essential to the nature of performance but I think there's also 
a very particular um, magic about this work and that it, it seems to have a number of uh, transformative moments within mm. the, the structure of it. Um, how, how did that um, structure occur? Was that something that you devised, Nick, or together with Will? Um, those kind of... It was kind of organic, speaking back to the, um, the Grand Central Station uh, 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 show. We would notice how the audience reacted to the horses, and specifically the children. Like children, they have no inhibitions. They're free, they, you know, you can't tell them no, all of that, they're, whatever they're gonna do, they're gonna do at that moment. So some of the kids were petting the horses. <laughs> we were feeding them imaginary apples. <laughs> we were like, wow, we didn't choreograph that, but this is, uh, it was instantaneous, and right away, and it's truthful, and mm. nothing is like the truth. You know what I mean? So, um, as we continue to do this project in other cities, we was like, wow, that's the common thread. That going back to Nick's point about dreaming and optimism, like when you're a child, you think you can do any and everything and nobody can tell you no. And so we just saw that in each city that we went to that the, it, it was limitless, the reactions. And not even just from the kids, the, the adults. When we see the adults looking at their children like, <laughs> oh my God! Look, he's—you know what I mean. That—that—that that, that first look. So, that's the—that's the special part for me, and it comes from uh, the dancers. It comes from um, it's clear communication from the dancers and going past that third wall that we're taught in the theater. You know, and clap when you're supposed to clap. And do the, no, it's so interactive, and you cannot <coughs> you cannot choreograph that. So it. It just began to take on a life of its own. And to me, that's why I love to work with Nick and Bob. This, that's part of the project that I hold dear to myself, like mm. these interactions, and it's all different in each city. These, uh, these dancers are paired up mm -hmm. as a horse, so two individuals as a horse. And they're given the permission as well as encouraged to work together to decide what kind of horse they really want to be. Mm -hmm. Do they want to be, uh, you know, a strong stallion? Do they want to be, uh, you know, a funny little pony that's like quirky and like silly, like a clown horse? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> because they all, there was a clown horse it in, was. in Sydney, was there not? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can be one of those if you a want. Clown and horse. But what's really amazing about that is, um, it, that's why it changes so much. And I think that's why the performers invest so much. Mm -hmm. You know, because it is their performance as mm -hmm. much as it's your performance, as much as it's yours, as much as it is the viewers. Everybody, it's it's all theirs. It's not here. Come look at this. It's here. Come be part of this. Yes. And Good I point. think everybody takes some sort of ownership within the performance. And I think that's where, for me, it's like you know, I'm I'm interested in stepping back and allowing that to sort of become part of building the project. Um, and so it's really sort of. Uh, you know, we're always excited, mm -hmm. you know, to see the performance. You know, I've seen it a number of times. And, uh, but, you know, yes, in Sydney this past week, it was, like, fantastic to see it again. Um, you know, it's always just sort of, and in particularly last week when, you know, the world was just in a bit of a, Implosion. Uproar. <laughs> Uproar. <laughs> Let me tell you, I woke up that next morning and I was like, oh my God, I'm just not feeling it today. <laughs> and Something then this performance, <laughs> the performance happened and I really, all of a sudden, it all made sense again. This is what why I do it. what I do. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. all sort of like made sense. And art became way more important was okay. that day. Yes. Mm. You know? Yeah. It is. It's very, there's so much <laughs> hope and joy, isn't there, in mm -hmm. that moment where uh, something comes into your, your daily reality that has um, such colour and kind of rewrites something fantastical and then that, that energy just swirling and rising. You know what's super cool when you say colour that mm. I just thought about? Um, you'll... I think you come <coughs> away from watching Herd and you're like, it's so full of color. That's what you come away with. But watch when you see it start out. 
because mm. most of the horses at the get-go when they're all dressed, most are fairly natural and neutral colored. Um, there's some yeah. that are like special pink horse or you know rainbow, um, but most of them are pretty neutral. And it's at the point that they separate and become two and they're individuals that they become really full of color. Mm. And so I think that's a really interesting little subtle story that's in this work too. Yeah, how did that um, evolve within the creative process, that decision? Because it's really, I suppose, being a performance work, it really operates over time. And uh, so you're giving this uh, sense of um, itinerary and surprise and a journey. Um, was that something that you, you structured in from the beginning or you realised the potential? You know, y y yes, no, maybe, I don't know. I just sort of <laughs> like, you know, sometimes I just sort of like sketch in the moment. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, and, and in this particular piece, I think Grand Central Station sort of taught me a lot about the piece mm -hmm. because I think, you know, uh, Prior to going there, we had a green room and a sort of a, a sort of a location where, you know, th uh, the horses were going to be stored and, and dressing area. But then, when we got there, we didn't have any of that. So, like in the matter of twenty four hours, we, we had to come up with a plan. Mm -hmm. So basically, we then sort of. I sort of decided that we will th then dress right on stage. Mm -hmm. The stage will then function as storage. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that changed the whole sort of performance. And then I sort of realized that I like the fact that I, I'm not hiding anything. Mm. That yeah. it breaks apart and it breaks apart. I want you to see it. It comes back together. I want you to see how it happens. And for some reason, you know, everyone is seeing it, but the moment they come back together, it's like all yeah. that you saw before, it's no lo yeah. longer yeah. relevant. Right. So it's just these sort of things that can sort of happen, I think, with, with ways in which artists are working that can sort of, it's all about informing the audience with clearly, you know, what is authentic yes. and... Uh, and then allowing that to sort of be part of the delivery. The experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm just thinking, uh, Bob, how has, how has this worked for you, this collaborative um, process uh, with, with Herd and then also, you know, working with, with Nick? How has that, uh, <laughs> you know, impacted on your own uh, creative practice? Like you do a lot, uh, a lot collaboratively, don't you? We do a lot of work together uh, now a, a lot of times I'm just supporting and a lot of times I'm building other work alongside it that um, I like to think of it as helping amplify what the message is because we talk a lot about how the importance of the work and how the work all has a job to do the reason we're making this work is so that it can live in the world and actually do something um, and so if I can help amplify that effect, that's kind of how I see myself as just an amplifier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, well, like we, we were tossing up uh, some beautiful uh, wallpapers that mm -hmm. you designed, um, working with these incredible uh, patterns. And then we, we whether we would uh, include those in the gallery display here. And then we, we decided there was just so much going on. But it was such kind of like an incredible um, menu to have on offer to be thinking. Well, you know why we think about that? Like, that all came about because um, it's again about how do you get <coughs> work outside of uh, the white walls? How do you get it to the people that really need to see the artwork? Mm. And so we talked a lot about other ways of doing that. And if we can take elements of the artwork, which at its essence is about providing joy and a place to think, um, then we can make these other things that are easier to get out into the world, like patterns that are built from the artwork, but they are their own thing. So you experience them a little differently. It's not like we're showing you a facsimile of the object. We're showing you something new that's built of the, the essence or the DNA of the object. So mm. that's how I like to think about that work. Mm. And that was something which really attracted us to this project because I think, um, you know, we're 
we're delighted to bring it here for the celebration of Goma's 10th birthday, but we also very much want to be um, sharing the state collection with, with the people of Queensland, Australia, and even to continue to share this work um, internationally. So uh, the way in which this work um, you know, reaches out to people across different communities um, and uh, I think probably, you know, hits some unexpected audiences in a way. It kind of comes to people, you know, has the potential to come to people in their own uh, communities. Um, yeah. I think that Nick's work in general, I, I think across the board, um, has this ability to um, allow many people in. Mm -hmm. So you could look at it from this really um, high level, it's beautiful or it's joyous or it's, it's easy to love on that level. And then once you get a little bit closer, you start to see the message that's behind it or underneath it. And so then it starts teaching a little more lesson. And then once you're like in love with this work and you're steeped in it, you start to be like, wow, there's a lot for me to get out of here. And, oh, and this might even be a little scary. I got to think about this a little harder. Yeah. So that, that's what I love about the work is that it's so available on whatever level someone's comfortable with at that moment. And mm. maybe we get them a little farther along than they were yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and can you talk a little bit about, um, you've just opened um, a new exhibition um, until at um, Mass Mocha. Could you describe some of the, uh, the process of that and the experience of that work? Oh, God, it's such big a big work. project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we just opened a new project in at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Massachusetts uh, titled Until, and it's... Um, it's really this sort of immersive uh, sort of installation. It's a very different way for me to work. Uh, it doesn't really incorporate any sound suits. Uh, but I think uh, what I was interested in was how can I put you into the belly mm. of a sound suit. So that's basically what you walk through, which is the size of a football stadium, is this sort of immersive, kinetic sort of uh, it's a kind of environment. Like a landscape environment. Yeah. 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 And uh, and part of this project also is a space for uh, convenings, for social gatherings, uh, for uh, programming that will take place within the installation. Uh, in call and response to uh, the sort of project. Uh, and the project is really sort of set under the sort of direction of looking at gun violence and, uh, and sort of uh, racial profiling and, and really sort of talking about that and, again, the effect that is had within of my community. Um, and so really sort of trying to create a safe haven for ways in which we can come together to continue conversation and dialogue around that. Yeah, the title Until actually <coughs> comes from, uh, it's, a, it's a distilled version of uh, innocent until proven guilty, mm. or in this case, guilty until proven innocent. Mm. And so we distilled it just down to until in this kind of hopeful way, like someday <laughs> this will no longer be an issue until. And um, mm -hmm. I, th I think that's, again, another uh, example of how there's a lot of weight in the subject there, mm -hmm. but we're giving you a very easy way into it. Right. Okay. Um, you actually walk through five different experiences, is that right? Right. So um, you walk into this space that's entirely floor to ceiling and 50 feet wide, um, spinni a spinning metallic forest of sorts. And you almost have to settle there for a few minutes before you can even discern that there's a pathway in. And once you spend a little time and you see that pathway, you enter, but you enter with like, what's next? Because you really can't see what's next. And you start walking down this journey and you realize that some of these spinning metallic objects might be flowers and butterflies and happy things, but there's also guns spinning and there's bullets spinning and there's teardrops spinning. 
and you're like, oh, and, but you mm. have to keep going forward. You know, there's no turning back. And then it opens up to this giant clearing that is this enormous cloud made of crystals and crystal chandeliers. And you're looking up under it and it's, it's, it's overwhelming and it also consumes you in this way, but it's really beautiful and you realize that there's four ladders that you could walk up. You can jump in whenever you want. <laughs> four ladders you walk up and you could I'm stand on top of the cloud. <laughs> and once you're on top of the cloud, you can see other people peering across the cloud, but now the landscape's totally different. And it's covered in metal toll and ceramic birds and uh, metal flowers and black lace lawn jockeys holding, but not this time, instead of lanterns, they're holding dream catchers. And so they're now owning this land. Um, and then you come back down. And if that's not enough, you go through some more spinners. <laughs> and then you come into a space that's almost the size of this room. And it's backed by a cliff wall that's made entirely of pony beads. I think there's something like uh, 16, 16 million, million. Mm -hmm. 16 million pony beads strung on shoestrings that build these mountain shapes. And you walk through them and around them until you go through a little cave into a room that's a uh, 360 degree and the floor video installation. And this is kind of the most disturbing of all the rooms. It's, it's very kinetic and uh, agitating. Um, and you're actually the floor is actually moving um, water and the walls are a performance that's been pulled apart and reassembled in this new kind of way. And then you go upstairs <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> through a rainbow um, <laughs> that's, what is it, that's made from a CD and a light, that's it. Um, <laughs> which is kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you walk through this rainbow and then you come to this waterfall that is called Flow Blow and it's a wall of metallic uh, mylar. mylar fringe that's constantly being blown because it's backed by industrial fans so it's constantly blowing at you and it actually says the word flow so it's almost like this cleansing and then you have to walk all the way back <laughs> you are good at that what you a beautiful you did an amazing <laughs> job <laughs> yay <laughs> Bobby and it's come it's going to be in Sydney yeah, um, yeah. so close to you <laughs> Our colleagues at Carriageworks, I believe, in 2018. Yeah, 2018. Yeah. 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 Yes. So, uh, so that's very exciting. And could you tell us, so the rainbow appears in a number of guises, doesn't it? it? Does. And we mm -hmm. have um, the beautiful rainbow. I didn't realise until uh, you mentioned this morning that uh, you had both uh, performed mm -hmm. rainbow. It have you performed in a public performance? Or I know you'd sent us the video of just rainbow lonely at night um, <laughs> and yet still full of personality uh, on a kind of like a sporting field, I think, yeah. uh, kind of trotting around. Roaming the around. city, just, <laughs> out, just <laughs> out at night at 12 o'clock roaming the city. <laughs> <laughs> Late night Lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did not actually perform Heard in Rainbow. But how long just were we performing? Oh, we were in there for hours. Oh so if any of you complain, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> 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 Wasn't the photo shoot? Was yeah, it was for a film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a film. Mm -hmm. So Rainbow is a very special horse for you, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what um, what you <laughs> yes, what is, I'm trying to see what I could uh, peel, peel back here in the questioning. Have you worked with the... Uh, you've mentioned two rainbows so far. We know there's Rainbow the horse, and then there's this moment, this fragile moment of the rainbow within until. Um, you know, is the rainbow something which occurs in other places as well within your practice, Nick? Or You put one in the mountain. Yeah. I, I think it's just that sort of... Uh, it's just that sort of thing that, you know, it's like... It just happens when it happens, and you see it when you see it, and it's magical, and it needs to be nothing more than that. Yeah. And then rainbow here, you know, and then I'm thinking also when I'm looking at the sort of um, gay sort of flag yeah. and looking at those colors, and, and that's what it's about. It's really about sort of uni unifying sort of all nationalities and, and that becoming a symbol. 
all for possibilities. That. Yeah. And yeah. And I think he is a he, right? Rainbow. It all depends <laughs> on what you're looking at. <laughs> depends on who's rainbow for the yeah. week, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, rainbow can be anybody. Anybody. He's anybody. Yeah, so it's really about that and just sort of again, you know, it's about really, you know, marking and sort of saying something through a symbol. Mm. We're very, um, I mentioned this morning that uh, we uh, were really delighted. Um, our director, Chris, was uh, sharing uh, <laughs> news of this work with one of our most um, special and important benefactors and who we we're looking forward to announcing uh, some more news on this work, but we were really hoping we might be able to um, bring her more permanently to Brisbane and Rainbow got the uh, the kiss of excitement <laughs> and approval, and uh, so we're um, we're really delighted about that, and um, you know looking forward to uh, you know caring for um, herd here um, into the future, and uh, I think the this kind of sense of herd as a um, energy release and energy uh, circulation point, uh, something that kind of draws together people and their own mm -hmm. stories. Um, we were talking earlier on about how there's this kind of um, uh, feedback loop between particularly the um, uh, performers who perform the head element of the horse that they're able to uh, choose to um, engage with audience members. Um, and I think, like, Will, you, you had a, a special take on that as well, like how that was uh, being a performer mm -hmm. and receiving that, that feedback yes. directly. The immediate feedback is, um, I think it it's good for the audience, but it's also good for the performer, because the performer sees the immediate feedback, and then they put more into the performance, if, I, if I'm not being redundant. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a reciprocal type of exchange. Mm. So it's, um, once again, breaking that third wall and um, creating instantaneous moments. And... Um, relying on the dancer's individuality, the, 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 the horses that, that, that they created, the temperament of the horses that they create. And then they create these things and then they go to someone in the audience and then it's all erased. So what do you do in that moment as the horse? Do you go with the moment or do you rebel against the moment? So it is, um, yeah, it's ever changing, ever growing, ever layered, so. Mm. And there's this sort of, uh, you know, the thing, that the beautiful thing that that I see is that there is this sort of way of communicating without talking mm. Mm. to one another. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the performance will sort of, will sort of receive that quite quickly. And that's, you know, the moment that you know that you're communicating through movement, all of a sudden you start to establish a relationship. Mm. And so it's so magical and yeah. so enormous when they know that they are, have made contact, mm. and then that sort of sort of changes how they proceed. And what's so beautiful also <coughs> is not just the relationship that they have with the audience, but the relationship that they have with each other in mm. the cast, the other horses in the cast. Because we we've seen moments like um, in Sydney where two horses decide, like, we're going to be best friends to get to that. Forever. Forever. The whole time. And every so performance, the time, they stayed together. The, the two horses stayed together the entire time. And we're like, what's their backstory? <laughs> so it, begins to, it begins to, like, you know, what's their, you know, it, it your imagination, like, oh, my God, what is their story? Or we had one rebel horse <laughs> who was like, I don't care about anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the other horses would look at him and like, oh, Come into life. get on board, buddy. What's going on? You know what I mean? So the relationship that they forge within each other. So it's like we're looking, we're privy to their story. We're looking into what's happening in this um, made up world. You know what I mean? So it's, it's and it changes every day. And I think the horses, you know, they really sort of speak about us as individuals. Mm. I mean, they, you know, mm. they, they each have their own markings. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really about this sort of uh, multicultural sort of world in which we live in and how do we sort of collectively sort of come together uh, 
you know, move together as, mm. as a collective whole. And so it's really about, you know, an individual sort of connection and yet a sort of collaboration at the same time. So there's, there's lots of things that are happening. Mm. And, and also with, with, you know, who's at the performance, mm -hmm. you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, we want diversity. We want it to be, be yeah. people of all, uh, so it's in, in in that moment is that moment where, you know, you we we do feel like we're sort of in a shared sort of mm -hmm. moment in time, mm. and we're uh, sort of all part of an experience all together, and 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 we leave feeling yeah. different. There is definitely <coughs> that that idea of flow in a sense, mm. isn't there? There's something that just flows around to everyone as as that energy is mm -hmm. is shared. Um, I was interested in this, like watching this morning, this uh, amazing group of dancers uh, quite surprisingly swiftly uh, forming into um, the head and tail section of the horse. So they have um, quite a, a strenuous task to um, undertake to become that entity of one horse. But the there really is a sense of uh, a kind of bonded unit um, starting to form. Mm -hmm. Um, which is very uh, fascinating to watch. And can you talk a little bit, Will, about that uh, that process of, of nurturing the uh, the character of each each horse? And yeah, I think we came up with this um, in Grand Central Station when we when we did it with uh, sixty of the Ailey students, Ailey dancers. By the way, one Gabrielle, I think is her name. She did it with us in New York, and now she's yeah. <laughs> with, uh, she's Australian, and she was going to school at Alvin Ailey. And um, she came up to me at the rehearsal today and was like, do you remember me? I'm like, wow, see how, you know, life is an average. Global. <laughs> yes, but I think sweet. we came up with that process in New York where we would see, by way of improv, who will we, and it was simply who had more character or who had more, more um, what's the right word? Front or? Yeah, <laughs> you know. Who had more front than the back? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like more of a. Um, it's a carriage. It's a projection. It's a carriage, yeah. 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 And we all, the and backs are pretty amazing as well. The aren't backs they? are totally They're different. Yeah, and it's actually. A, they have a very special More role choreographic, also. right? Yeah. yeah. But and the fronts are very. Right. Yeah. Chesty. And just as important <laughs> as the Chesty. front. <laughs> But yeah, the, the, fr the fronts have this harness on, so mm. that speaks a lot to who we were picking, who we pick as the front also. Not that um, who can handle it, but like literally who could handle this, mm. what is it, six foot harness, four foot harness, as well as do choreography. So that process started in New York and um, we just solidified, solidified that, that part of the, the project. Like every time we go into the city, the first thing we do is see who's going to become the head and the tail by doing this improv progressions across the floor. And, um, and also, I think, you know, you know, there's dances that just bring fire. Yeah. Honey, and we're yeah. just like, oh, my God, the fire yeah. is in the room. Right. <laughs> and so then we just start picking and pulling based yes. on yeah. just, you know, everyone sort of delivers and comes yeah. at it. Right. I'm amazed in various our smoke alarms ways. didn't and go so, off this morning. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, and so we're kind of looking to them through, you know, these exercises that we are sort of putting them through to sort of determine who's played sort of what role within within mm. the project. But both roles are so, are so significant. Mm -hmm. mm. They're so significant. Because let me tell you, the moment they separate, the audience flips. Yeah out yes <laughs> so you know and then that's when the back ends really sort of like take it yeah. to a different level and in we the can see in these images can't we this kind of cape that mm -hmm. the head uh wears which covers the rear of the horse and then uh the uh, rear end has this beautiful additional explosion of yeah, color colorful top but um i c can i say that australia is the first time and this is in sydney um, it's the first time we saw the back ends really bringing it, right? <laughs> so, like, Australia's got the best butts of everyone we've ever worked with. Yes. And so, like, That's it really has changed. Really. 
It has changed. <laughs> I, I'm looking at him to say, well, who's going to wiggle the butt? Because that's hard to get a lot of attention on the back end yeah. when you're covered. Yeah. So we saw this one girl in Sydney, and she, I was like, do you have a fly on your butt? Uh-huh. And she said, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm like, okay, now we have to really to be looking at who's going <coughs> to act with the back end, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> hey. That is. <laughs> it's wonderful, yeah. Yeah. And the, um, the structure <coughs> of the moves between these, uh, you know, quite uh, choreographed elements where people are moving in unison, mm-hmm. and then this uh, improvisation is really mm-hmm. key to uh, what you're doing in this kind of sharing of uh, control and the creative mm-hmm. process uh, within the work. Yeah. I call it controlled chaos. <laughs> So to speak, you know what I mean? It's a metaphor for life also. Like we all s- we go through our day and everybody's just into what they do, but we all are tolerant of each other. We all respect each other. Like, and then before you know, we're all working together. That's what it, that's what it symbolizes for me. Um, and we were hearing, I was hearing a lot of, uh, a lot of comments in Sydney like, oh my God, are they gonna get to their lines? We didn't know when they were gonna like, get into this formation and all of a sudden they're in this formation. (laughs) And I'm like, wow, yeah, that's a a metaphor for life. Like we can all be in our own chaotic world, but then we can all work together when we have to. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And not divisive and, okay, I'm gonna get off my soapbox. I was about to get on the soapbox. (laughs) But yeah, you know what I mean? It's 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 an important point. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, you know, I think we're all feeling it's a time in the world where we're a little unsure about just how we'll be able to work together mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, whether we can really um, pull it together in, in new ways and to yeah. see these energies um, uh, cracked open but also coming back into shape and something very joyous mm-hmm. is, um, is a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing about art and this work particularly because I think you alluded to it earlier about how we have people from different parts of life, different generations, like younger and older, specifically in Sydney also. We had, I think the youngest was 18, 17. The oldest was 40. So you're coming from different perspectives about life, um, uh, different cultures. But somehow we all came together we brought all of our experiences together and we came up with a beautiful product. You know what I mean? It's, it should be such a metaphor for life. Like, to me, uh, hate and divisiveness will not solve anything. And it's just all about love. I'm just so about love and positivity. Love. And, uh, love. <laughs> Optimism. But no, really, it is, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> shake so it. <laughs> But uh, that's why I feel so blessed to be an artist, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I have the most, the best job in the world. Like, I go to work and I play, literally. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the bless, it's a blessing. And this is the thing is, it is a job, you know, I teach at the School of the Art Institute Mm -hmm. of Chicago, but when I'm not teaching, I'm in my studio. I get up, I'm in my studio at 9 with everybody that works there and mm-hmm. then they leave at five and then I'm there to about midnight. I mean, so this is my, this is the daily schedule. So it's not, I take it very, very serious. Mm-hmm. I'm going, and so I get up and go to work. Mm. The fortunate thing that it's like everything that I could possibly imagine doing. There's a lot to be done. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot to be yeah. done. We've got a lot of work to do, boys. <laughs> so yes. <Yeah. laughs> 